Hey, this is Mark Damon from The Pretty Reckless, and you're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. Hi everyone, John Liebman here for Nodehead Media. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. We are here at the 2016 NAM Show, Winter NAM, Anaheim, California, with none other than Mark Damon. How you doing, Mark? Good, man. Nice to meet you, bro. Nice to meet you, too. Boy, there's uh, a lot to tell about your story, all the cool stuff that you've done and that you're doing right now with the Pretty Reckless and everything else. Let's start from the beginning. You're from New Hampshire. Yes. I'd like to hear about the early days, how you were first exposed to music. With uh, you come from a musical family, or were your parents musical, brothers and sisters maybe, or records playing, going to concerts, things like that. How would you describe your musical upbringing? Well, um, my dad had an amazing vinyl collection. You know, everything from like Sonny Rollins and Harry Belafonte to Captain Beefheart, uh, everything in between. Uh, what I a cool dad. Yeah, great, great stuff. And uh, he'd be down in the basement. He had this uh, this photo lab down there we used to you know develop black and white photos he's a little bit of a photo nut and he'd be playing records all the time and you hear him through the floor i'm like oh that's kind of cool so i'd go down and stand outside the, the door of the the dark room listening to records and um my older brother ended up starting playing saxophone and i'd see him playing in you know high school jazz band go oh i want to do that that's really cool but i knew if i picked saxophone he'd kill me so uh <laughs> in junior high uh, when they bring the, all the instruments to the classes and you know, show you what the, they're all about, uh, they looked at me and I was one of the bigger kids in class. They said, ah, you should try the trombone. It's the easiest one to play. They lied. It's not the easiest one to play. So I started my life as a trombone player. And actually, I still play uh, professionally on trombone. Uh, and my musical career started as a trombone player. Um, I did not know that. Yes. And uh, through high, uh, high school, you know, playing trombone in bands and ended up picking up uh, tenor saxophone as well. And, uh, I hope your brother's not watching. <laughs> Don't kill me. So, um, I didn't pick up bass until college. Really? Uh, yeah. You know, I ended up, you know, I was, I was really into jazz music, and, and uh, you know, that was my thing back in high school and early college. And I started getting into more rock about my maybe my junior year in college. Uh, when I joined a, a band, I was playing in a horn section with like a funk rock band. And the bass player was killer. This guy, Chris Hall. Uh, he lives in Vancouver now. I'm not sure if he even plays anymore. But he was just this guy. He was just the coolest thing ever. He played like, uh, what the hell, he made P-Funk stuff and like the uh, Funkadelic. You know, it's, it's like those lines just really resonated with me. Bootsy, Bernard Yeah, Odo, Boot, all yeah. those guys, man. And he, bring, and he exposed me to like some of the OJ stuff and more, you know, the oh, Motown right. and, yeah. and Stax stuff. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. So I picked up bass, started fooling around with it, and just ended up, you know, just taking to it. You know, just kind of felt right. Um, and started playing in some bands, some rock bands. Uh, Plus, you probably could have practiced a lot of the bass from your trombone books. Exactly. It was. I, th I think I used it was to do that a lot. Well, yeah. I mean, although the, the Bach cello suites for trombone, it's like it's that goes, I right, never did. goes right to, did right to bass. Right, so it works out well that way. Um, so I think also the the timbres were similar yeah. in trombone and bass. So I was very drawn to that you know that realm of the of the sonic sphere. So it kind of resonated with me. Who were some of your other bass influences? Oh, gosh. Um, with Jocko, obviously, even though I'll never, ever, ever, ever play like him, and nor will anybody, you know, truly capture that. Um, Rocco Prestia, obviously, was a big, you know, influence. But as far as, like, people I feel like a kinship to, like Lemmy was a huge influence on me. Yeah, you know, it was a huge loss to. The I think baseball. I noticed you were wearing yes. Yeah, yeah okay. you know, and, and, and tribute, um, not necessarily his technique, but his ethic of real raw in your face. Here it is, no excuses. Um, that really resonated with me. Um, Michael Anthony, you know, even though people don't give him a lot of credit, you know, when you listen to what he's playing, solid rock bass playing. You know, it's just. It's what it is. There's People really like him. I interviewed him, and uh, last we counted, they're pretty close to 500,000 hits on YouTube, and 99.99% .99 of the comments are very favorable about Michael. Michael. Anthony's fantastic. You know, not just I mean about think, his singing too. You know, his, you know, I'm still saying, yeah. just not just his playing, but his singing. You know, most people think of him as a, as the background vocalist for Van Halen, and they forget how, what a great bass player he was. Tone, feel, touch, everything was just rock solid. Um, 
and from not the rock world, like uh, Family Man Barrett from Mar Marley's Band. Family Man. He, he was a huge influence. Like his lines, his the fat tone, the feel, the way he and Carlton played together. Yeah. It's the, the rhythm section interaction was just amazing, uh, and that really set the tone from for my playing about really interacting with the bass player. Those the are drummers. some great influences. Tell me about the Pretty Reckless. How did that band form? What were you trying to say? What was the group all about? How would you describe the music? Or anything else you want to say about the band? Well, um, Ben, the guitar player, Jamie, the drummer, and I were playing in a band, uh, a, a rock, hard rock trio, for several years before we met Taylor. And we ended up meeting her through a, a producer friend of ours. And she liked what we were doing. And her and Ben started doing some writing together with our producer uh, for her, you know, she was doing a project she wanted to you know she really wanted to Taylor Momsen yeah Taylor Momsen and she heard our, our records that we had done and some of the stuff we were working on she's like I want to sound like that we're like well you can't because that's us and she's like well you should I should be your singer we should be a band together we're like ah, I'm not so sure because at this point she was like 15 years old oh, wow. and being the jaded you know musician I am I thought, 15-year-old TV star, eh, I don't want anything part of this, man. It, it's, it's not going to be real. I'm, I don't want to deal with that. Like, I, don't want, I want to be part of like a Disney BS kind of thing. And uh, so we became friends with her. She you know, came to our gigs. We hang out. She was like a really cool person. You forget she was 15. She was a, such an old soul. And eventually, you know, we heard some of the stuff her and Ben were writing, some of the demos. And she convinced us all to get together and, and do some playing. Like, okay, we'll, we'll get together and play a little bit, see, you know, because you're nice. And we heard her singing live the first time we were in rehearsal. And we're playing uh, the song Light Me Up off the first record. And we're grooving, she's singing the verse. We're like, oh man, this girl can sing. Damn. And then we hit the chorus, and her and Ben started harmonizing. And dude, goosebumps. I was like, whoa, that was something else. And we finished the song, and no one said anything. And I looked at each other, we're like, I guess we got a band. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about your equipment, Mark. Well, uh, pretty much I'm playing Fender basses, uh, Fender P bass, Fender uh, jazz bass. How can you go wrong with that? Right? It's ro they're rock solid, really. Yeah. How about strings? I play GHS strings. I'm using the round core boomers right now. Love them. Uh, rocking the DiMarzio pickups and all my instruments. Uh, I have a custom bass that was built by a guy in Texas in Rob Bridges from, called Brimstone Basses, Brim, Brimstone Guitars. It's called the Grand Toro. It's a, it's a really it's a beast of an, of, a, of an instrument. It's really cool. Uh, so it's nice to have a, you know, something custom built for you. Yeah. you know. Tell me a little bit more about the GHS strings. I know you've been playing them for a while. What, what They're really popular. They've been around. I like them because they're a Michigan company, for, uh, you know, among other reasons. But tell me what you like about them, why you've been playing them so long. Well, you know, when I first started playing, I tried everything. I tried the, the GHS, the you know, Diodario, the, the, you know, the, the Dean Markleys. I tried all, all the brands and always kept coming back to the, uh, the Boomers and the Super Steels. And they just had this, this edge to them and this clarity that I didn't really kind of get with the other ones. Plus, they seem to last a lot longer <laughs> than That's a lot important. of the other bases. Um, and then uh, I've pretty much settled on using the Boomers for a lot of years and then uh, was able to hook up with you know, the guys at GHS recently. And they sent me out some prototypes for these round core boomers. And basically, it's a, the high end's a little more tailored, a little more uh, subtle. It's a little less brittle than the, than the boomers are. Boomers have a real you know, attack that can really snap your head off. These are a little bit warmer, a little bit more refined. And they really, really work well in the studio. You know, they really record really nicely. And uh, in live, my, my front of house engineer loves them. Uh, I'd been using boomers for a while, and I, I threw on some round cores. And as soon as I played, he came up to me after soundcheck. He's like, did you change something? I'm like, well, I'm trying some new strings. He's like, yeah, the high end was just was set really nicely. I'm like, all right, strings make a difference. I yes, get it. <laughs> That's great. How about the future, Mark? What else have you got coming up? Or what else would you like to do that you haven't done yet? You're still, I think you're pretty young. There's a lot of things. You have a do. lot of energy. <laughs> and uh, well, what's, what's on that list? What, what would you like to tackle? Oh, geez. I mean, Luckily, I get to live the dream. I, I really, I get to tour with my best friends around the world playing music, music that I love. So are they still your best friends at the end of the tour? They truly are. It's, <laughs> it's a bizarre thing. I've known our guitar player, God, for 17 years, and I've known our drummer 
been playing with him for about 20 at this point. So we're, we're all brothers, and Taylor has just really fit in as our little sister, and it's it's really a family. And you know, it's funny our crew fights more than the band fights. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> uh, but right now we're doing our, our brand new record. Right, I was going to ask yeah. you about that. We're in the middle of uh, recording the new record, uh, and the songs that the Ben and Taylor have written are just fantastic. And, uh, do you have a name for the record yet? We do not. And when do you expect it to hit the streets? When it's done. <laughs> <laughs> we also have the luxury... Mark we, your calendars, <laughs> folks. <laughs> we have the luxury of the, the label we work with, Razor and Tie. Oh, yeah. It's very hands-off. They let us do what we want, what we need to do to make it great. Uh, they have a lot of trust in us. They've given us a lot of you know, freedom. And uh, we don't take that for granted. We know a lot of people who don't have that luxury. Great. Well, that's, that is indeed very fortunate. Last question, Mark. What would you be if you weren't a bass player or a trombone player or a sax player? What would you be if you were not a bass player, something outside of music? Uh, wishing I was a bass player. <laughs> okay, not a bad answer. Um, I don't know. I mean, when I was young, I was really into surfing. Maybe I would you know, become a beach bum in Maui. That was surfboard, okay. plumbing on the beach. Did you surf in New Hampshire? Yes. Really? Yes, New Hampshire and Maine. Really? I always thought of that as more of a West Coast thing. Well, it's uh, it's a little colder on the East Coast yeah. than the West Coast. And most of the, the good surfing is in the fall and the spring. So you have to get like a full-on wetsuit with the gloves and booties and the hood. Yeah. And well, you know what? Steve Bailey is really into surfing. He's from North Carolina, so I guess... Uh, they get some good breaks down there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, they do. Very good. Boy, you never know what's going to come up. Hey, Mark, great catching up with you. Great Likewise, getting to know man. you, and good luck with the new record. Yeah, and uh, let us know what it's called and when it comes out, and we'll be sure to share it with these You'll folks, be the first too. You'll to know. All right. <laughs> from the 2016 Winter NAM Show, Anaheim, California, for Notehead Media Group, I'm John Liebman. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com.